like a craft beer through a pint glass. These are the gaze of our lives. A show where Lisa and Avery get out their gay decoder rings to decipher the gay alphabet and bridge the gap between the older and younger LGBTQ community and everyone fucking else. And now here are your hosts, Lisa and Avery. Don't blame them. Hey guys, it's Lisa. And Avery. Today we have a very special guest. We have former boxing manager Kelly Maloney here to talk to us, not just about her transition, but her views of the boxing world now. All right. All the thank way you. from a, oh, sorry. Oh, thank you for joining us today, Kelly. Uh, thank you for inviting me. <laughs> All the way from across the pond. Where are you exactly? Exactly right now. I'm at my home in Portugal. So I have a, I have a home in Kent in England and a home in Portugal. But I'm here in Portugal with my four dogs and my two goats. <laughs> two goats? I'm jealous of the goats. I know, me too. <laughs> are they the best pets Minnie ever? Minnie and Mickey. Minnie and Mickey. I love that even better. <laughs> are, they, are they the best pets ever? Uh, they're, they're quite unusual, yes. The dogs can't quite make them out. <laughs> I bet. My dogs would not go okay with that. So, you um, are a trans woman, correct? Yes, I transitioned. Well, I started transitioning quite a while ago, but it became very public uh, exactly five, um, five years ago this month. Um, my story broke in a national newspaper and went worldwide. Um, yeah, it was a decision that was taken out of my hands, but it was a decision I took back to do my story so I could control the way it was presented, the the terminology that was used and the um, pictures that were used because unknown to me, I was being followed by the British press and a paparazzi and I was having pictures of me taking things like that that I didn't know about and I didn't look my best so I didn't want them pictures used. <laughs> <laughs> so you said they, was it somebody else kind of outed you? Uh, well, I don't really know the full strength of it, um, but I, obviously I've got three daughters and an ex-partner and we sat and we spoke about the situation and we wanted to train, and I was living here in Portugal in my house, very privately, going about my business as Kelly, no one really paid much attention, no one knew, because I'm very lucky, I'm five foot two, and I'm quite um, petite, so it's not as if I stand out. And I sort of dress to blend in and not stand out. And um, I was just living my life, and I was going back and forward to England, and I was at, next thing I knew, I got a knock on the door at my house from a, an English newspaper, which I won't name, and they said they wanted to run a story on my alternative lifestyle. And I asked them what they were on about. And the guy said, well, we believe that you live part of your life as a woman and part of your life as um, as Frank Maloney and that you are going through a transitional period. And I sort of laughed and and I, and I sort of had my hair, it was quite long and I was sort of dressed very, um, just very casual, like T-shirts and jeans, thankfully. I wasn't in dress or anything and um and i just laughed and said I, I think you must be mad and they showed me these pictures and i denied it was me and they said well we're going to run the story and i said well that's your choice but i will sue you and i saw when they left i broke down and i just broke down and cried and thought oh no it's it's out now how's this happened and i phoned my daughter who in turn then phoned my my solicitor that was my solicitor through my boxing business and everything and he didn't even know about my transitioning but she sort of explained it on the phone and in fairness to him he took control of the situation we met at his office on the friday we met a top qc on the afternoon letters were all sent about the place and finally late that saturday night 
they managed to stop the paper print in the story. And um, it was a constant battle for a while, but unfortunately, I had to go back to live regular as Frank, which was really hard because I was on hormone treatment. I was sort of living my life, but I knew I was being followed and I couldn't give them any more ammunition than what they had. And then eventually, my, my lawyer called me to his office and he said, look, he said, I have to, I'll address you as Frank because you're in your mail mode, but no Kelly is who you are and you want to be. He said, so please excuse me. And I said, that's fine, Neil. Just, and he said, look, I, I think you're going to have to take control of this situation and you're going to have to do your story with a national newspaper or just put something out there. He said, because you, you can't keep hiding. He said, and eventually you'll have a breakdown and yeah. other things can happen. And he was quite right because I, I was on the verge of, well, I, I attempted suicide. Yeah. I, was on the, I was on the verge of a complete breakdown. So my lawyer and my eldest daughter negotiated a deal with a newspaper who gave us editorial rights, who gave us headline rights and picture rights. And we agreed to do the story and all the right terminology was, I didn't want the word sex change used or graphic headlines like boxing promoter has balls cut off because that's what the English press are like. <laughs> um, I wanted it I wanted it put across so that people could understand it and realise being a trans person is not a choice. It's something that's there in your head, it's always been there since you were small. And you are a human being and you should respect, be respected the same as everybody else. And I wanted them to understand it wasn't about my sexuality, it was about my gender that was my issue. Um, and thankfully, the paper agreed to all that and we went ahead and as I say, the story was printed um, five years ago, This I think it was about the 15th, 14th of this month that it was printed. I mean, I know they're going to do a follow-up in a couple of weeks, but... Um, and, and since then, Touchwood, um, you know, I've been able to live my life the way I want to live it. I've been accepted quite very well in public um, and by some people. There are obviously the ignorant ones out there that will never understand it. And there's the keyboard warriors that um, still attack me and uh, make rude and vile remarks about what I've been through. But I, I can't let them beat me, and that is, and I, I think you've got to stay strong, and you've got to project, you know, a positive image because there are, you know, there are trans people that have not been as lucky as me. A couple of people that were on the same journey as me have never completed their journey. They just couldn't, they couldn't stand the, the stigma of losing everything, um, the way that people turned against them, the haters, as I would call them. And unfortunately, they're no longer with us. So it's it's just, I've just been very lucky. And I've got the support of a great family and three, three brilliant daughters. That's great. I, I can honestly say, I think it's so important to have that community around you. And it's so good to hear that you had that, especially when it sounds like you really were able to take control. So when you say you wanted to kind of control the verbiage, um, going forward with that do you really like it i mean i guess ever since then have you really been able to control your story other than obviously the ignorant pieces like well yeah i i mean i always get mainly to read my stories before they come out if i do if i do stories of a set newspaper but obviously because of social media whatever goes up on your twitter account or your facebook account or your instagram account can be pulled down or passed on to newspapers. And there's been some stuff that I've put up which has been funny stuff or pictures that, you know, me enjoying myself that made the papers and they've not been too complimentary. Mm. But I overall, the papers are pretty good to me. There's a couple of papers that are quite right-wing in this country and they, have, they are very anti-trans everything and whatever way they can... And they get, they get to me by often referring to me as boxing promoter Frank Maloney and and thing, and they know it gets 
my daughters and me, we all sat down and we always, we agreed no matter what happens, I would always be their dad, which you can't not be. But they could refer to me if dad is they wanted to. And we made that point to a lot of newspapers. But they love to refer to me as my daughter's mum there. And to me, that's an insult to their biological mum. Mm-hmm. Because I can never be their mum. Yeah, you know, I'm, right. one of the only pictures I've got of Frank is on my wall over there. It's one that my daughters gave me the last Father's Day. And it's a picture of myself, three individual pictures together on a placard with all my daughters in uh, one is my eldest daughter's wedding, one is my young daughter on holiday with me, and one is my middle daughter at a boxing promotion with me. And that has, and I keep that on my walls, so my daughters will always realise that they haven't lost their father. All their father has done is corrected something that was wrong at birth. Have, how has the boxing community accepted you? You have some people that have accepted you, but how has the boxing community uh, some of it, some of, I, I don't really do a lot of work in boxing now. I, I, I've, I follow it and I'm I sort of on the fringe. I, I did do a little bit of advising, but I wanted to live a total new life. I wanted to enjoy my life because boxing it at the level I was at is very stressful, mm-hmm. very um, painful, you know, and it's also very hard. And I, I had a number of. Um, issues like I had a heart attack at the ringside one, at one show oh, wow. I'd passed that a couple of times through the stress factor um, and it's like you know to me but the level I was at was you're swimming with sharks and you either have to become a shark or you get eaten alive and I, I didn't really want to be a shark because I'm not that way inclined um, and I thought do you know, I, I can't keep going. I, I can't be the person I want to be and make up for all the mistakes I made as Frank. Because as Frank, I wasn't always the nicest person. I made comments about the gay community I should never have made. I made comments about other people. And it was all because I was protecting myself and hiding what I was going through because of the world I was in. Mm. And I felt, I don't want to be like that no more. I want, to be, I want people to see the real person I am the person I've always wanted to be since birth and I decided to walk away from boxing um, I read I read Twitter funny enough I was at lunch with some girlfriends today and we were talking about it and I was reading some of my Twitter account and some of it's quite very good but there are the keyboard warriors who are very vile and do attack me about um, my transitioning and about my boxing life and you know, I mean, to use one, there was a fight not long ago. James DeGale, who the American public will well know, and he lost his world title fight. Mm-hmm. And the, and one of the quotes that went up was, well, it all depends what he's got in the tank. If it's anything like Frank Maloney, he'll have nothing because Maloney's nuts are now empty. You know, and it's just stupid things like this. Mm-hmm. Um and one came in the other day, which was really nasty, actually. It was probably, and it was one that said, really, very, all that surgery you had still doesn't make you a nice person. You're still an ugly effer. I won't swear. And, um, you know, if I ever get the chance to see you, I'll, I'll push you off your kitten heels. Hopefully, you'll break your neck at the same time. I'll pull that cheap wig off you wear. And I just think, why do these people want to do this and say that? I'm not causing anyone any trouble. You're just trying to live your new life. So, Sorry? So you chose to walk away from boxing. It's not because you're not getting the opportunities because you've transitioned. You chose to walk away. Well, it's very hard. I mean, you know, obviously fighters may not have... I lost my TV contract just before I transitioned. And Because uh, of that? Without... uh, No, it wasn't because of that. Because the um, star fighter got beat a couple of times and it was getting harder and harder and um, I just felt without TV without TV you can't survive in the boxing world you know I've I know many of my American colleagues that I've worked with who are still very friendly with me they've lost TV because the face of boxing has changed and they can't afford to promote or because boxing is a sport if you want to make a small fortune start with a big one 
Oh. <laughs> it's true. I mean, go ahead. Well, I was going to say, so would you, I, I've heard kind of like, I think, what is it? Um, what's, the, what's the... Getting a bit dark. Yeah, I did. I Got a little bit. Let, um, let me just put some... Okay. That might be better. Oh, there we go. Yeah, that's good. Perfect. Now we can see your beautiful face. See? <laughs> Uh, sorry, I uh, had an accident yesterday. Ah. Um, I, I got knocked out, and you know, I boxed myself. And in all the time I boxed, I had 69 fights. I never cut once. Yesterday, I'm having a a mobile home built in the grounds of my my house here for when my daughters come with their friends because they're quite wild and they like to stay out till quite late at night. So I thought if I build a, a studio apartment over the other side, they can. And I walked over to have a look at it yesterday and the roof wasn't fixed properly. And unfortunately part of the timber came down and it caught me on my head. It knocked me out. I was out cold for about two minutes, but it split all my eyes. So I've now got a, a box as a cut on my and eye. And you never had one in all the fights. That's hilarious. That's awesome. Never had a cut on my eye. Is it zone? Is that the station that took over for HBO? Is that what it's no, called? I don't. Well, HBO stopped fight. I had a contract with HBO yeah. with Lennox Lewis, and to be honest, they they were very good to us. They looked after us. They treated us very well. Seth Abrahams was a brilliant person. Um, uh, what was the lawyer's name? I think he still promotes there. Um, he's actually just become my friend on Facebook. Oh, that shows you. It'll come to me before the end of the interview. But they were brilliant to us and they treated us with utmost respect and I loved working in America I found the American press were really good to us, the American public accepted us because Lennox Lewis was a good fighter and they appreciate they appre no matter what nationality he was they appreciated him and to be honest I think they loved the Union Jack suit I used to wear um, I was always made welcome in Atlantic City Las Vegas were at New York Wherever we was, we were made so welcome. So, you know, I, I'd just like to thank... I never really got the chance to thank the American public and press for the way they looked after us, but thank you. <laughs> so, speaking of Lennox, did he have any idea that you were going to start transitioning no, before? No one had any idea. Um, I, 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 I made such um, a point of it, never... To, to get out, I was I was so careful. I was living on eggshells, if I'd be truthful, because I was frightened of it being exposed. I was frightened of it wrecking my um, career with Lennox, and I was frightened of it destroying my family. Um, I, I fought my transition all the way. If I could have beaten it, if there was a pill I could have taken, I would have taken it because, you know, I... I I'm a very happy person now, so I'm not going to lie, and I, and I'm, I'm glad I am the person I am, and I'm so contented with my life. But I lost a lot of things to come to this point, and there was a, at one point I feared I would lose my family. I lost my partner Tracy, who I was deeply in love with, and I suppose I still love her. But I know we can never be together, and thankfully we are we are very close, and we're very. We're very good friends. We meet for coffee. We'll we'll have the odd lunch or dinner with the girls, and she'll come to Portugal and she'll visit me for a holiday. But you know, it's a purely different relationship to what it was previously. Um, and 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 I, I was. These were the things that I feared losing. I feared losing my daughters, who who are really the apple of my life, and um, I'm lucky that. Their mum helped them, and my first wife, Jackie, as well, with Emma, my eldest daughter, who has been my rock through the whole of of this, and, and she still is. If anything, she's my conscience. Um, so, I, I, you know, and if there was a pill I could have taken, and, I, and I'm sure many trans women would have said, will say the same thing, if they don't, I think they're telling lies, because, you know, you are... You are risking everything when you when you start to transition, and if your transition is very public, you know your family go on that journey with you, and it's very hard. 
you know, I've got a very good friend here in England who transitioned, and she has lost her daughters and uh, family members over it. And we we speak a lot on the phone, and she refers to me of how lucky I am. And if my daughters could, you know, if her daughters could be like my daughters, but we're all different. But and I just tell her, you know what? Just keep praying. Just keep being positive. Your daughters will come back to you eventually because, you know, you, we only have one set of parents, and That's true. Yeah. I think parent and children's love should, is unconditional love, or it should be unconditional love. Absolutely. Now, if you could, and it wasn't harassing to be back in boxing, would you want to go back into promoting if they accepted you like they used to? Because you were well, if I, you were a if champion I, promoter. I was, I was, the, I was. You the were the one. promoter. I know, I was. I was that cheeky southeast London Cockney boy that took the world by storm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, would I go back? Yeah, because I, I loved boxing. I wasn't motiv. Why I was so good at my job was I wasn't motivated by the money. I was motivated by the passion and to be successful. Yeah. And yeah, I, I, I do. If I'm, I put my hand on my heart. If I'm honest, I do miss boxing. Um, but I also enjoy the life I live now. I live a, I do a lot of charity work. I do a lot of awareness work, and I feel my boxing life has helped me become the person I am now, and has given me the confidence to go out there and stand up and speak in front of crowds to help educate others. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think God had a had a message for me and has taken me in a different path. Um, if I had a choice between going back into boxing and continuing the work I'm doing now, I would rather continue the work I'm doing now because I think it's more helpful than the work I was doing in boxing. That's, That's awesome. great because you were you were a beast at that. So I can only imagine what you're doing with this. It must be pretty amazing. Um, I, I, I'm just being myself, you know. It's and I'm sure we've all done this. You know, I know the LGB community. It's hard for them to come out. Certain, you know. Right. Again, they must fear losing their family. But when you can stop hiding the person you really are, or the person you want to be, your life changes. You know, your life totally changes, and you become a you become a free spirit. And and that's I was never a free spirit, but now I am a free spirit, and that's how I look at my life. Yeah. No, I am. Um... <laughs> I started transitioning uh, a year and a half ago, um, and I and I can honestly say I've never been a more honest and full person. And so just hearing you say being caged up, it's the exact, it's just the truest form. And honestly, I don't, I think that's the one difference between coming out gay, how I did, then transitioning is, because when I came out gay, I still wasn't out. Like, I still As wasn't trans. myself. Yeah. And so it's like, I'm sure, and I can't imagine what it was like to keep like, especially because it sounds like Frank was an entirely different person, you know? So to put yourself in a form and then finally be yourself, I'm sure this is easier for you to do all these things you're doing now. Yeah. I mean, Frank used to get up in the morning. He'd look in the mirror and he would actually say to himself, who can I go to war with today? I'm going to put on this suit of armor. I'm going to go out there and be an actor. Kelly gets up and looks in the mirror and smiles and says, do you know what? It's a privilege to be alive and it's great to be able to go out there and just enjoy life and not have any fear. And that, and that's the difference with my life now. You know, people saw the, the Cockney kid, the kid that was never gave a, a respect to many things that was just purely motivated on what they were doing, but they never saw the person that was lonely in a hotel room that was drinking to the excess because they were hiding something and they were hiding their true self. Absolutely. And that's, you know, it's, as you said, it's like being caged and, and just, and being like a bird being caged and all of a sudden, or a wild animal, and all of a sudden being put back into the wild. The freedom is something that you can only experience if you've been locked up or been in that cage. Absolutely. How long, how old were you when you felt that you figured out that, wow, I think, something's different about me. I think I'm born was, in the wrong body. I was three years old when I realized I was different. But you were three years I old? I didn't know what it was because 
it was in them days who knew yeah. about uh, trans issues who you know my parents were irish working class good catholic church going parents um my father was a typical irish man he adored his family loved work loved going to the pub loved his sport and he had three boys he, he couldn't ask for anything more um and that's how we were brought up and we were brought up to be competitive because we were three boys you know um, we all went into sport in one way or another my middle brother was a professional boxer who i managed and worked with my younger brother done swimming and athletics um, but never pursued it in a as a career um, and it, it was you know from the age of three though i knew i was different my father took me to football to soccer in your case you call it soccer <laughs> yeah. uh, took me to soccer and you know i still follow that club now um sport will always be part of my life i don't i don't think it matters if you're male female um or whatever your sexuality is or whatever your nationality is or whatever your religion is sport is something that everybody can enjoy and take part in yeah. and, I, and i think that's very important as well and i think that's that's also helped me now do you think in the boxing community because i i'm just like you coming out in the boxing community is just so big do you think there are a lot of boxers that are in the closet because they're scared to come out because it I seems like know. it's not uh, lgbtq friendly well, you know, there's a big thing in this country about soccer players coming out and things like that. Um, there's never, no soccer players come out ways in his career. Um, no, no boxer in this country's come out as a gay boxer. Um, but I don't think, what does it matter about a person's sexuality, a person's gender? If they're good at what they do, you know, I couldn't care if, if the whole of my football team were gay as long as they were winning. You know, that's, <laughs> Amen. You know, that's, it doesn't matter what a person does. A person's private life is their private life. Yeah. It shouldn't be the subject of the, the world's press and the world's people. It, you know, I, I don't know. It's, I've lost a lot of friends who can't handle what I went through. And I think, well, why can't they handle it? I'm still the same person. I'm still a human being. You know, I can still sit and talk sport with them. I may not go out chasing girls. I may not go nightclubbing. You know, things that I had to do under protest before. But deep down, I, I, I'm, a, I'm a human being the same as they are. I'm not, I'm not a freak show. Mm. You know, and, and that's the impression I get from some people. They look at you as if you're a freak or you're a pervert or something. Mm -hmm. You know, and that's something no trans person is. We agree. Yeah. It's well, and unfortunately, there is that stigma. People see you like, you know, even people see me, and they realize I'm not really going for a female look. And I don't really guess trans, but it's enough where it sets them off. So I mean, and unfortunately, I think that's true with gay people too. Yeah. You know, but yeah. I, I like to think it's getting better. It is. You know? Definitely getting better. But it doesn't help that you've got Donald Trump as president. Lord <laughs> knows. Hope <laughs> that we've just got his brother. Or his young son as the prime minister in England, oh, uh, yeah, Boris Johnson. Johnson. Yeah, I forgot uh, that Johnson was was your new prime minister. I know. You know, they they they're leading up. They're leading. They're steering people more to the right. Mm -hmm. You know, and right wing nationalist people don't like anything that they can't understand or that's out. Of, and I don't use this lightly. I don't know what is normal. So, you know. I used to think Frank Maloney was very normal, but he wasn't because, again, he was hiding so much. Um, so what, what is normal? Normal is respecting the laws of the land and the laws of the country you live in and respecting your fellow human being. To me, that's all that really matters. Be a good person. That's easy. Should be, at least. Yep. Just be a good Just person. Be a for sure. Um, so I love it that you're, you have found your happiness now and you don't have to hide and, you know, and you spewed the anti-gay stuff and everything because you were trying to make sure that nobody saw that part of you, right? Yeah. I mean, yeah. if you, 
you know, um, I, I, you know, I, I get on so well with the gay community now. Where before, as Frank, I was terrified of the gay community because I just felt they would bring outside of me that I didn't want people to see. I didn't want people to know, um, you know, in that macho world I lived in, um, and. I, I said things I shouldn't have said, you know, and I and I, and I apologise to that community for that. Um, and now, you know, I, I speak at um, Pride events, I speak at LGBT events. Um, I will say though, I'm a great believer that the LGBT should be the T should be separated because the T is purely about your gender, mm -hmm. and the I LGB know. is about your sexuality. Yeah. And I also think. By the two being together, it causes a lot of confusion yeah. in to people who don't. Know, and I, and I, I, will, I say this honestly. I do not. Since I've transitioned, I do not know my sexuality. Um, I never. I've not been in a relationship in nine years. I live on my own with my dogs, um, and I have a great social life. I've been out to dinner with few men um i've been you know i've got very good female friends i say my gender is who i go to bed as my sexuality is who i wake up next to mm -hmm. and since i've transitioned i've only woke up next to my teddy bear so what does that make my sexuality? <laughs> <laughs> uh, i don't but know what I that one would be i think we can all learn from each other yeah you know obviously the lgb T community and I know you know they 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 have fought such hard battles for acceptance um, and you know we can learn from them and we can help each other you know I, I don't I would like to see LGB and T uh. at least put an and in in there just so pe and so that we get the chance to explain that the T is about our gender right. you know if I if I do have a relationship with a female and then, to me, I will be a member of the LGBT community because I'm a, I'm a female lesbian. Mm -hmm. If I have a relationship with a male, as far as I'm concerned, I'm a heterosexual female. You know, it doesn't matter what the rest of the world think about me. It's what I think about myself that counts. I right. get it. I know. You're I a straight man. I'm you're just a straight saying. Man. It shocked it. me too, okay? <laughs> He's a straight man now, so I get it. And, and you know, and that's the thing with... But I'm Hey, you can come over and take me out to dinner. I'm available. Okay, but only if I get to see the goats. And the fiancé has to be okay with it. So. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, that's, that you're absolutely right. When it comes to trans, that's where I was confused before we started this. And this is all about me and everybody else learning because... You're right. It, it gets confusing when it's with the LBGTQ that they think it's sexuality and it's not. It has, mm -hmm. And I thought that originally because I didn't know. I, mean, I got asked by a couple of people, friends actually, and I've been asked when I do my speeches and I take questions at the end, did you, um, did you want to live as a woman and be a woman because you wanted to sleep with a man? And I'm thinking, no. You know, I've always believed I should have been born a woman. I've always felt I was female. Um, I will never be a biological female. I accept that. And I, and I know there will people who will never accept me as a, as a female. But as far as I'm concerned, I'm female. I'm a medically constructed female. Um, and I live my life as a female. Um, and that's it. You know, if I fall... It, I, and I also, I've learned since transitioning, it's actually not the sex you fall in love with. It's the person you fall in love with. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that's something you've got to... You know, we're brought up... If you're a boy, you're brought up to find a girlfriend and get married. If you're a girl, you're brought up to... I, I know times are changing, but, you know, in my generation, girls are brought up to be pretty, look nice, and attract a nice boy that would keep her and look after her. Um, but times are changing. And, you know, it, 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 it's, it's changed now. But I realise after meeting lots of people and talking to lots of people, you actually fall in love with the person, not the sex, not the sex. You know, sex is just a, a, by, a, a bypass of a relationship as far as I'm concerned. 
our mutual friend uh, Brad when he said something about getting you to come on our show talking asking you he goes I said do you think she will and he goes well as long as his heart ha or her heart hasn't changed from when it was Frank and I said I guarantee you the heart is actually better than it was when it was Frank because she's probably happier now and he goes yeah because and she's he, an amazing he's person right. you know he's dead right um, you know I you know, if I walk out, you know, if I walk out and I saw a female and that person and I could, we communicated and we got on and I fell in love with her, I'd accept that. If I went out and I met a male and we communicated and there was something there, you know, then I'd, I'd accept that. It's the person you fall in love with. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I look at it, you know, how much time do you spend with a person? You spend more time with a person talking to them socializing going out then you actually spend in bed that you know having sex so sex is just a a bonus you know some people can have some people can have a great relationship without any sex so going back you to know. what you said uh, oh sorry going back to what you said though do you think that's maybe why our vice president is all anti lbgtq he's hiding his desire to be in the community i'm just saying <laughs> yeah I, listen i always think if someone's anti something they're high that listen i made that i was totally anti lgb as i said i wasn't but i was hiding because i didn't want anyone to know about my trans issue you know i made a couple of jokes about trans people i remember once being at a big boxing convention and we were chatting and I was sitting with a group of, and I won't say the names of the people, we was all around the table, all high-profile people. And you can imagine what a group of boxing managers and promoters are like in a, at a convention. The talk is, after boxing, what you do it during the day, the talk at night is about, well, who's going to get hold of who, who's going to screw who tonight, and where's the nearest brothel? And one guy went, well, you've got to be careful. So, and I, another one said, what do you mean you've got to be careful? He went, when I went out the night before, and he went through, and he went, I pulled what looked like a stunning bird, and so it's going. On, and so so goes, well, what happened then? He went, well, he went back to the room, and all this happened. He went, when I stripped her off, you can't believe what was between her legs, like, and, and it sort of hit me, and I went, oh. So I sort of said, well, what did you do? Did you just? He went, I fucking kicked her and punched her in the mouth and slung her out of the room. Or I slung it out of the room, the, the freak. And I just thought, my God, how can I ever let anyone know what I'm going through? That just, you know, it's... And that was just the community you were with, you know? Yeah, and they were, some of them were quite high-profile people in the boxing world. Oh, my gosh. Like, I, I just, I, I can't... can't imagine how you, how you wouldn't be scared to come out as trans I can't anything. imagine how small that would make you feel just like thinking like you can't even talk to people you're around you no, know you, you, and that's why I kept it bottled up for so long yeah. there I mean there yeah America's quite a big place I was quite lucky there were a couple of places that I could get when I was in New York that I could go and I could for a day or a couple of hours become the female I wanted to be um awesome. There's um, a lady that runs a thing called a school for boys that want to be girls um, in downtown New York on the east side. And, you know, I visited that a couple of times. And I'd go there. She had no idea where I was. She'd spend an hour making me up. And then she'd take me for a walk around uh, Greenwich Village or for a meal or something like that. And we'd just sit and chat. And it was such a relief. But then I had to go back changed and then i'd go back into the world i didn't want to go back into was there ever you know? a time where you realized your life as frank was limited or did you just kind of plan on keeping that up no i plan i i, I just said i i fought hard to keep it i thought i could do what i was doing but i, re I was having counseling for over 10 years Thanks. and i remember my counselor saying to me the day when i when I first started going counseling, I went there to make it out I was suffering with anger management. Well, I was an angry person, so I wasn't lying in a way. Uh, <laughs> eventually, when I got the courage to tell her that I was a transgender woman and that I was fighting it, she went, the day you lift the lid on your Pandora box, you'll never put it back on. 
and eventually, bit by bit, I start the lid starting opening and opening and opening till finally it it fully opened and I couldn't close it anymore. Mm -hmm. Wow, I'm sure. God, I can't even imagine being in the community that you were in and being hearing them about beating up women, or you know, like that, and then you well, feeling pain, like that. Only unfortunately, yes. Ah, oh, can't. I can't imagine being that scared to be yourself. I can't. Uh, well, <laughs> I, mean, I can't. I just, it's horrible. It's horrible. I, I, that breaks my heart. Though. I, but no. then at the same time, yeah. it yeah. makes it all the more, yeah. I think, better when you are out your Pandora's box is open, if you will. You know? Yeah, you, you can be yourself now. You know, it's nice now. I remember, like, I used to go shopping in New York when I was there or in Las Vegas because, you know, you've got great shops. In there. And I'd go in and I'd buy, I'd make it, I was buying clothes for my daughters or for my, my part, ex-partner. And I'd come outside and I'd feel ashamed of what I'd done. And I'd screw the clothes up and throw them in the dustbin. You know, so some person came along and found some nice dresses or nice shoes or some nice underwear. But it was just, it was my release. That sort of just walking around the shops and buying something was another form of release for me. I you know, it's, I don't know. It's. I look back now and I think, God, the things I've done to hide it. Why did I hide it? Because I'm such a happy person. You know, I'm, I'm such a nice person. Not, I'm nice. I feel nice, if you know what I mean. I'm not saying. I, I haven't become a saint overnight, so. I don't think the gates of heaven would be opening to me straight away. <laughs> Not without some haggling. <laughs> I think happiness yeah, too. I might have to bring a bit back of Frank Maloney to negotiate my way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think happiness, though, when you're happy with yourself, it just makes you a better and a nicer person, period. I don't think there's no ifs, ands, or buts about that. Well, a more honest person. Well, you yeah. know, my, my, my daughters have said it to me. They went, do you know what? It's, it's not what we wanted. But you know what? We've got uh, we've got a dad who's happy now, and you know my daughters, they know about my attempted suicides a couple of times. You know, and you know what they say to me when we'd rather have our dad in a dress than in a wooden box, and that gives me the courage to continue to be myself and know you know to know that that they that their love for me is is unconditional because you know that they could have said, my God. No, we can't have nothing to do with you, as you you've messed our life up. Because I do sometimes get a little bit of guilty feeling that I I, I may have messed their life up or caused them unnecessary stress. And that sometimes I think, have I been selfish in transitioning, um, in giving in and going through what I've been through because of my children? But you know, when they talk to me, I realise that they're happy that I'm happy. And, and, and that's very important to me. I think it's it's, it's made me a bit, that's made me a better person as well. I love that they would rather drive you around in a dress than in a wooden box. That's that's that's, that's huge. That's a beautiful sentiment. That's in that, huge. In the, I mean, the phrasing is kind that of me morbid. Cold chills, but... actually. <laughs> that's good. That's huge. That's awesome, though, and that they're that accepting of you. I mean, that they came up with that yeah. to say that because I mean that tells you yes, you're doing it right. You know, I mean, yeah. that gives you validation that well, you're... And a relief of, like, a lot of guilt. Yeah. I feel like that's a big thing people who are transitioning go through is a lot of guilt in what they're putting on people. But, like, it's really nice when people can say to you, no, this is definitely what we would prefer, you know? Yeah. Well, I think, they, to be honest, I mean, I think they prefer having their dad as a male, mm -hmm. but they, they know that's impossible, and they know if, I, if, I, if they didn't have Kelly... I probably wouldn't be here today and so for that I think they're grateful and um, you know and I'm also going to see them grow up you know my middle daughter had a um, proudly presented us with a grandchild uh, a year ago and it's been lovely because you know I've got two other grandchildren from my oldest daughter and I never saw them grow up because I couldn't accept it I was frightened to get emotionally involved with them um, and you know I wasn't if I'm honest, as Frank, I gave my children what they wanted, but I don't think I gave them the love that I give them as Kelly, mm. because I was I was frightened of I was frightened of my own emotions, I was frightened of everything. You know, and I substituted my emotions and my love with money because I had 
I was earning very good money being the manager of the heavyweight champion of the world. And you were damn good at it, right? Too. And to be <laughs> fair, though, that was something you were excellent at. But <laughs> but I think that I think it's really beautiful to see the balance that you have found in your life as Kelly, but also in accepting your past as Frank. Yeah, well, you know, number one, I always say is you can run from your past, but you can't hide from your past. You know, right. and you know, when I first went into boxing. You know, there was another great saying that for boxing promoters, you'd say a story today and then you'd say something the next day and a journalist would go, ah, but yesterday you said, and you'd go, yesterday I was telling a lie, today I'm telling the truth. Because you know that would be chip paper, as we would like. But because now everything goes on the internet and online, whatever you say is always there. Like the comments I made about the gay community when I, when I was involved in the politics in, in London, they're there forever. They, they haunt me forever. Mm -hmm. Some of the things I've said in my boxing career, they haunt me forever. You know, some of the things I've said as Kelly, um, my, when I first sort of came out and I was trying to make excuses and, you know, I talked about my previous life, uh, things that wasn't in the public domain. They're now on the internet and people can use them against you. And people have used them, you know. Um, there was an incident um, when I was transitioning up. Well, I w when I was fighting myself, I was very bad. One night I went out, I got very drunk, I came home. I got into a massive argument with my partner and I um, grabbed her and I put my hands around her neck, you know, and thankfully I came back to my senses and I didn't do, I didn't do anything else I should. Um, but you know people now refer that I admitted that I nearly strangled my wife and maybe I did but I didn't do it intentionally and that from that when I came back to my senses I actually checked myself into a clinic because I was so terrified of the person I was becoming to seek medical help and help but a lot of the feminist groups and the anti-trans people always bring that and say why should we listen to a person that tried to strangle their wife you know and I, and I think there's no need for that because, you know, you wasn't in that room. You don't know what I was going through emotionally. What I'm not I'm not, I'm not defending it because I, I, I don't defend violence against another human being. But when a person is emotionally unstable, you don't know they're capable of doing anything, you know. And that's when, like, my daughter phoned me yesterday, not yesterday, the day before. Her best friend was at her boyfriend's house. And she walked into his young, his sixteen-year-old sister's bedroom, and she was hanging from the light from the ceiling. She committed suicide, you know. So no one knows what that poor young girl was going through her mind. No, you know, you, the mind is a is a very a very strange thing, and certain things can click the mind to go the wrong way or go the right way. Um, it's, you know, I, I don't, I, you know, I still sometimes suffer, as I said, with a black, this black cloud, um, not nowhere near as much as I used to, but now and again it will descend on me, um, and, you know, I have to phone my counsellor or phone my eldest daughter or one of my other daughters and and just get them to talk to me to get to to get me out of that that situation because. Because you 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 don't know what you're capable of doing it when when that happens to you, because mm -hmm. you you lose all all thought of reality and what is what 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 you should do or what you shouldn't do. You just think of one thing, you know. The time the 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 three times that I've attempted suicide, I I, I don't know why I done it because then I was in such a dark place, a place where I I I. The only way I could see out of it was to take myself out of this world. But all you're doing is causing more pain and anxiety for other people. But no one understands, you know, unless you've been in that dark hole or in that corner or that place, no one will ever understand. And people will judge you wrongly over that. You know, so many of our, our uh, guests have said the, almost the exact same thing and so many of them have tried to commit suicide because they weren't happy with who they were. They couldn't figure out how to get to where they were going to be happy 
And I, for one, and I'm sure Avery would agree, a lot of us are very happy that you found your happy, and that's hopefully out of the way now, and you can carry on and just be happy with you the way you are. All I need is to find a partner. <laughs> <laughs> They're not all they cut yeah. out to be. Yeah. I'll be in okay. Portugal in like a month. We'll go out. We'll bait the town red, babe. That's <laughs> it. <laughs> thank you so much for coming on here and talking to us. And we greatly appreciate it. Thank you for your honesty. Yeah. And honestly, I've, I, you have described transitioning so well in such a way I can relate to it. I really hope viewers see this and really gain inspiration because really you have a great way of speaking about it, and I can tell why you're so impactful in the LGBT community over there. Thank you so thank much. You. No, thank you. Hey guys, if you'd like to be on our show, reach out to us. We have a Contact Me page on our Facebook page, and you can find us on Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, Snapchat. and Snapchat. I forgot we have Snapchat. There we go. <laughs> awesome. Thank you, Kelly. Thank you. So much. Good we appreciate night. it. Good night. God bless. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. This has been Gaze of Our Lives. Make sure to check out the gaze online at www.laughs.life.